excited to be here. I'm going to be talking about how to contribute to Elixir and Phoenix. And this is a beginner level talk aimed at people who have never contributed before, really never been involved in an open source, open development project before. So f first things, we're going to be talking about building things from source. And there's necessarily going to be a lot of shell commands and output on the screen. Don't try to scribble it all down. That's my blog, and there's a page of talks. There are a couple of blog posts that go over how to build Elixir from source, how to build Phoenix from source. Uh, I'll, show the, I'll show it on the screen because I want you to see that it's easy, that it's possible, that you can do it. But it's, I would love to run this as a workshop where you have tasks to complete, and you can actually do it, and we can walk around and help you if it doesn't work. Maybe next year. And a little about me. My name's Wendy Smoke. I got involved in open source and open development way back, I had to look this up, in 2005 at the Apache Software Foundation. And I got involved the same way I'm going to encourage you to get involved, which is by asking questions, answering questions, fixing up the documentation. And while I was at Apache, I was having so much fun in Java that I completely skipped over Ruby. And yeah, I remember going to talks by Neil Ford, and he said, you really need to, you, you need to learn this thing. And I was like, no, Java's way too much fun. So missed that entirely, and then I was away from technology for a while. And lately, I was kind of looking for something new and something that, new to learn. I you know, looked at Clojure. I didn't really want to be on the JVM anymore. And so <coughs> this Elixir thing happened. I think it was maybe back in July. I picked it up, started playing with it. I started ask, asking questions, and I've even answered a few, and I've fixed up the documentation a little. And so I'm really excited to see where this is going to go from here. When I talk to people about getting involved in open source, usually I have to stop and say things about watching out for the project culture, hanging out on the mailing list, making sure there aren't any toxic personalities that are going to make your life miserable, and just thinking about where you're going to invest your time before you kind of dive in. This happened back when Ron Jeffries, who's a signer of the Agile Manifesto, was casting about looking for something new for himself to learn. And of course, everyone was saying, go, closure, and Elixir. And I just said that others can give technical reasons why the Erlang VM is the best thing for concurrency or, or whatever. But I haven't been this happy in a community since I was involved at Apache all those years ago. And that's something special. I can't put my finger on it. But it seems like we've got just a really good group of people that have gathered around this technology. And I'd really like it to stay that way. And it's incumbent on all of us to keep it that way. So why would you want to do this? Presumably, you have a day job, or you're in school, and you work all day. So why would you want to come home and work more and not get paid for it? So maybe you want something that it, maybe you are lucky enough to be using it in production, and so many people raised their hands earlier. And you need it to do something that it doesn't do, and this is the old scratch your own itch motivation. So you make something, you make it do something it doesn't do and you contribute it back and the world's a better place. Maybe like me, you want to just learn something new. Functional programming is all the rage these days, right? So you want to learn this new thing that's been around for a while. Making new friends. I've met so many people working online. I go off to conferences and my husband's like, you don't know these people. Yes, I do. I've known them for years online. I've just never <laughs> met them. <laughs> And back to the practical point, building your resume, this stuff doesn't look half bad when you put it on your resume. So the skills you learn interacting with uh, open source communities, debugging other people's, other people's code, uh, can be really attractive to, to employers. So that's not something to dismiss. As far as once you've decided that you want to contribute, what are some things you can do once you're here? So I'll come back to asking questions. If you're stuck on something, chances are someone else is too. And they may not have the time or be brave enough to like put that out there in public. So if you take the time to research your question, get a good question out there, and put that on the mailing list, that is a really big contribution because someone will come along and answer it. And 
as you get, as you learn more, you'll find that next week someone will ask the same question you were confused about the week before, and you're like, I know that. And like Jessica said last night, thanks so much to Jessica and, and Jose this morning for making these points already, that the experts are not the best people to answer the questions from, from new people or even to write the documentation because when the experts explain things, they tend to leave stuff out or they put things in, in order because they don't know what you don't know yet. So for a language and a framework and the surrounding technologies, this new, writing it down is one of the most important things you can do and contribute. Another really fun thing to do is reproduce issues. So if you're on IRC or Slack or on the mailing list and someone else posts a problem, you can try to reproduce it. And back to resume skills, debugging other people's code is something that's really, really useful. So if you can take a small snippet of a problem that may not even be that well described and figure out what's wrong, you can definitely use that skill later. And when you, maybe you look at it and it's just a typo, so you can help get that person past their, their issue because they just needed another set of eyes on it. Maybe you'll get to the point where you can make improvements. And it's important to note that this is not just code. This is not just uh, submitting a patch to Elixir that fixes a bug. This is all the little things around it, like uh, the release. I went to a talk on EXRM yesterday. So that is not committed to Elixir, but it's part of the ecosystem. And it's a really useful tool that you know, we need to do reproducible releases. So. Maybe you'll come up with something to add to the ecosystem. And like Jose said, they'll often, they're pretty conservative about what actually goes into the framework and the language itself. So if you come up with a really great idea, implement it as a separate thing, let people test it out, beat on it, find where it can be improved, and then maybe it'll get merged in later, maybe it'll stay as a, as a, as a separate thing. But don't think that just because you're not committing to Elixir Core that you're not contributing. And then getting to the point where maybe you are adding, maybe your new thing does actually get merged in and then you're officially part of Elixir. On the topic of asking questions, this is the first part where you can kind of make a misstep and end up in the wrong place and kind of get told that you're doing it wrong. So back when I started doing this, we had mailing lists and that was pretty much it. Everything, if you had a question, you went to the mailing list. That's where everything was. We still have that, but now it's Google Groups, which is the old news groups that got combined. So there are two for each of the big projects. There's Elixir, Lang, or, sorry, Elixir Talk and Elixir Core, and then Phoenix Talk and Phoenix Core. If you're asking a user level question, you belong on the talk list. This is kind of the first place that you may show up on the issue. If you ask on the issue tracker or you show up on the core list, People are really nice and they'll probably answer you, but they may tell you that to go over to the talk list. So that's something that you can just know before you show up in the wrong place and get not really reprimanded, but you know, it's can not can be not a great first experience if you do it wrong in public. And now we have Slack and IRC. Of course we had IRC has been around forever, but especially at Apache, it wasn't really used for user support and and questions. Stack Overflow is where all my answers come from. There's something on Reddit, I don't even have a login, and someone mentioned CodeWall. There's all these places now that you can ask questions, so it, it does get pretty scattered. These are only the English language ones that I'm vaguely aware of. I'm pretty sure it's duplicated in other languages, and I'm not even aware of, of where those are. So when you start answering questions, you can certainly reply wherever it is that the person asked. But consider that if you're on Slack or IRC, those wonderful answers will disappear because Slack, we don't have the archives for. IRC is logged, but it's not, it's not threaded and it's really hard to search. So if you have gotten a great answer or posted a great answer, often people will post a gist or a paste bin of their question, but they don't ever update it. So one of the great things you can do is grab that, you can actually fork the gist and fill it in and with the question and answer, and it's a really quick way to just capture it. Um, the projects have wikis attached to them, a lot of them on GitHub, and if it's not turned on, you can ask them to flip it on. 
I've, I have one on my own personal website, and I'll do the same thing if there's a great conversation on IRC. I'll just like copy it and paste it to a page on my wiki, because someday I'll go back and document it, <laughs> which hasn't really happened, but at least it's there, and I'll find it again. Uh, you can blog. Several people have mentioned this. If you don't have one already, start one. Jeremy Singleton did a really great blog post recently where he didn't understand something and he asked Chris and Chris patiently explained to him what was going on and had him go through some exercises. Well, he wrote that up as a blog post and said, I was confused about this and here's what Chris had me do and here's when the understanding started to dawn and then here's the final thing that was true. And that is great to have out there. The reason I'm up here today is probably because of my blog where I've posted all my ramblings about things I didn't understand and how I kind of stepped through and figured out some of the things. And then my favorite, the official documentation. So we're going to look at how to make your first contribution to the documentation without ever leaving your browser. This is the first kind of easy win that you can, you can do. We're going to start with the Phoenix Guides. And the link that the arrow is pointing to is the guides. And if you click in there, I've clicked into the community page. So but this talk is all about kind of developer onboarding, how to make it easy to get in. And I was focused on that last line, which says, if you have a question about the docs, open an issue or send a pull request. And I thought, well, you know, we've just finished telling people that if they have a question, they should ask on the mailing list. So I wanted to fix that. And this particular page is important because Open source projects are essentially competing for your leisure time. There, is, there are plenty of other things that you could be doing. My sadly neglected summer garden after I discovered Elixir is a testament to that because I kind of <laughs> never went out there and weeded it again. So, or maybe someone is getting up one hour early. They've committed to like getting up in the morning and spending an hour learning Elixir while the house is quiet. And that's all the time they have. If they get stuck, and wander away, we may lose that contributor. So as you're, as you're new to the project, anything you can do to help the next person who is new have a smoother onboarding experience is great. So, and also that page doesn't even say where the, document, where the source code for the guides actually is. So that could, be, that could have stopped someone cold if they didn't already know about GitHub and where these things are. So to, to make my change, I discovered preparing this talk, that that little pencil in the GitHub UI is a magic button. It will, behind the scenes, fork and branch and do all that for you so you don't really have to worry about it. And it's saying, edit this file in your fork of this project. I've used it in my own projects to just kind of make a little typo change, but I never realized what happens if you clicked it in someone else's project. So it'll handle all that for you behind the scenes. If you don't already have a fork, which is your copy of, of the repository, It'll do that for you. And every time you click it, it branches up to like the very latest. So submitting a change will write to a new branch in your fork. So having clicked the magic button, GitHub is going to handle making a copy of everything for me. I can make my changes and then click the preview. All right, now my, both my hands are full now, so. Still no? OK, we'll try this. And I can see the changes that I've made. I actually changed a few more things than the bottom line, but it'll let you see what you've changed. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, you'll get to propose your file change. So you write a, a short description about what it is you're changing. This turns into the commit message. You're still working in your own copy, so no one knows you're doing this yet. I think it is visible, but you haven't announced your intentions yet. So once you click the Create Pull Request button, now you're, you're, now you're working on the thing that you're going to announce to the community. So you can put in a description here. So if you're fixing an example, explain what was confusing. Because there are plenty of places, I'm good with this. So there are plenty of places in the documentation where things are technically correct. But like I was talking about before, when the Experts are writing documentation. They don't know what you don't know at that point because they've got all the information in their head. So I've fixed a couple of things where it was absolutely correct. It's just that that topic wasn't introduced until the bottom of the page. So a new person reading it is kind of not real sure what's going on. So now when you click Create Pull Request, now it actually exists. And the documentation team 
knows that you want to make this change and it's in the list. I actually had to find one to do so that I could take these screenshots because the, the Phoenix Guides team are so on top of pull requests that they merge them or comment on them right away and that list is usually empty. And if all goes well, then they say thank you and they, and they merge it in and you get hearts on your, <laughs> as a, this, is, this is Jose's thing. <laughs> So you'll get, you'll get your colored hearts on your, uh, as a comment on your pull request and you get listed as a contributor and then you get to celebrate on Twitter. So, <laughs> but sometimes <laughs> they want to change or it's not quite right. If, you, if it's your first time and you get to this point, then ask for help because uh, the ways of, of Git are incomprehensible sometimes. They will ask you for things like, can you please squash your commits? Well, if you're brand new to Git and you don't quite know what that means, it can be kind of off-putting. So just ask. If you don't want to ask on your pull request, email me with a link to it, and I will help you figure out the right things to type to make Git happy. <laughs> I have I saw my cheat sheet. And let's see. So that, that, that's making your first patch to the documentation without needing to ever leave your browser. So if you're just reading something, and even if you're off developing something, this is an easy way to just get something quick in there without the whole checking out and fetching and merging and, and all that stuff that goes along with it. So another thing you can do is reproduce issues. And you can just reproduce, if someone comes along and says, this, I, I, I did A and B happened and I expected C, you can work through their steps and reproduce it and try to help them figure out what's gone wrong. At some point, someone's going to say, I think that's fixed on master. I think, you know, I think that's already fixed. So can you try that on master and see if it still is a problem? So we'll look at Phoenix. Assuming you have an existing project that already has a mix.exs file, the first thing you can do is just open up your mix.exs file and swap out the Phoenix dependency and point it straight at GitHub. And then tell, tell Mix to go get your dependencies. And that's going to pull down the latest and greatest source code for Phoenix. And you saw me go from like 0 0.14 to what it, one dot, or well, we're on 1.0.3 now. That may not work. It depends on what else has changed. And it's also possible that the change you're looking for wasn't actually in Phoenix. So the next thing you can do to try out some issue that you need to see whether it works or not in Phoenix is to start a brand new project with the bleeding edge of Phoenix. And Phoenix comes in two pieces. There's the, the installer, the thing you typically install, and then the actual set of Phoenix libraries. So this is a bit of the Phoenix readme, which is in the source code, and has some instructions and why things are the way they are. I've, I made several of these changes while I was trying to figure out why things didn't work the way I expected them to. So the first thing we'll do is clone the Phoenix source, which looks like usual. You have to change into the installer directory to do this. It doesn't work anywhere else. You've got to be in that directory. And if you're in that directory and you check what version of the Phoenix installer you're using, Maybe it says 1.0.2. There's a trick here because if you have previously followed the installation instructions and installed Phoenix, you're actually using the one that is installed over under your home directory. So if you're going to work on the bleeding edge in the installer directory and try out a brand new Phoenix project, you actually have to remove. There's, actually, there's a mix.uninstall command, but that is the easiest way to just get rid of it. And now when you type mix phoenix new, you're actually using the code in the directory you're sitting in. And this is a, the usual command, mix phoenix new, the, test, the name of the project that you want to generate. That project has, the path to that project has to be within the phoenix checkout. We'll see why in a minute. And that dash dash dev switch is the secret. So this is what gives you a phoenix project that uses the very latest phoenix code. And it will do its usual thing and prompt you to install dependencies. And if you drop into your new project and look at the mix.exs file, this is what the dash dash dev switch got you. Uh, it defined Phoenix with a relative path. 
So now you have your bleeding edge project pointed at the bleeding edge of Phoenix source code. And that override will keep anyone else from changing you. And then you can start it and the usual. At this point, you can drop into that. You're, you're in the directory. You can try out whatever thing wasn't working, what, whatever issue the person was having, whatever new feature you want to try out. And you can try to reproduce it and take a look. But what if the issue wasn't in Phoenix, was, but was kind of in the language itself? So we'll look at how to build Elixir itself. So you, you heard Jose talk about all those new things that might be coming. One dot master is now set at 1.2.0-dev, and that's where those things are going to be landing. So if you're interested in trying out those new things or possibly participating in, uh, in developing them, this is where you'll need to be. Back to the Elixir website, the installation instructions have a bit on compiling from source. I've, these, by virtue of me being on a Mac, these instructions all work on Mac. People are doing this on Windows, so if you're interested in that, post on the mailing list and one of the people who are familiar with it will pipe up and help you. So again, we're going to grab the Elixir source code and then drop into the directory. Building Elixir is a little different. than It's not mix because Elixir doesn't yet bootstrap. I'm not sure where if that's even on the list, but it's make clean test that was on the, the readme. It's going to spit out tons of output at the end. I'm not syntax highlighted, but all, all the dots should be green. If all the dots are not green, you should probably open an issue or come ask. At that point, you've built it. So then you need to fix up your, depend, your um, environment. So right now, you've, if, before you do this, you've probably got Elixir installed from a, uh, from a package manager or however you got it originally. This will put Elixir on your path kind of in front of everything else. And once you do this, then, yeah, it's important to put it on the front. So you can check which Elixir. That should be pointed at, your, at the path to the source code you checked out. If it's not, you're still, you may still be using the installed one, which is not the one you want. And then Elixir-V will tell you 1.2.0.dev right now this minute. So right now, the code on master has never had a release. There's a branch for the 1.1 the that is still doing patch releases. As a, an aside, now that you know how to build Elixir from source, you can test release candidates. This is really important because the core developers cannot cover all the possible edge cases that you've invented in your applications. And it's really useful when the developers say, we're going to do a release, here's a release candidate, if you can test it out and just let them know whether it works. Otherwise, they do 1.1.0, and then they have to turn around and do 1.1.1 really quick because someone found something in production or you know, when they tested it out ready to deploy it that uh, you know, could have been fixed earlier. So it's the same git clone. You specify a branch, which is really a tag. Here's git being weird again. And I give it a directory to go into. That's the third line because if you don't give it a directory to go into, it's going to default to Elixir. You probably already have one of those. And I'm only showing the output because it gives you this ominous warning about being in a detached head state, which you can safely ignore for these purposes. Then the usual, it's the same build command and the same output. And then fix up your environment the same way. So at this point, you're pointed at that release candidate, and you can test things out and let the developers know. What, and report back either way. Say, I tried it, and it worked. Because the silence, they don't know whether anyone <laughs> tried it out or not. Now, still in Elixir, if you're fixing up something in the documentation, Elixir has a ton of doc tests in the, uh, in the source code itself. So you may be working on those. And those aren't quite the same as the Phoenix guides. You actually need to, if you're working on those, you need to actually build Elixir and then also build the documentation. So you have to do both because the doc tests are run as part of the tests. And 
So if you've been messing with the documentation, you need to make sure that you didn't break the build. And then you need to build the docs so that you can take a look at your changes and make sure that they look the way you want them to do. And if you're submitting a patch for the language, you may have written your own documentation versus just fixing up something that's already there. So we'll see how to build it. Another little snippet from the readme, which has a bunch of commands that you can copy and paste, we'll look through them. If you are following the directions, you're in the, um, you're in the Elixir directory, and you need to jump up one. This, this caught me out while I was trying to prepare this. I, was following, I pasted everything on the readme, and it didn't work. So I determined that uh, it was missing a bit that you need to actually back up one. And then in order to build the documentation, you need to have xdoc. This, this is predicated on building the latest of everything with the latest of everything. So we're going to check out xdoc and drop into the xdoc directory. What this is doing is using the mix that we just built when we built Elixir a few minutes ago to build xdoc. So this is all, this was all written when nothing actually existed yet. So you kind of have to, once you get into it, you can figure out what you already have installed. You, you, you may be perfectly fine using the mix that's already available, but it just depends on what you have on, in your environment already. I thought this was interesting because that do is not the Elixir language do. It's a mixed task called do. So as, in addition to learning all kinds of things about debugging other people's source code, I learn new things that I didn't know were possible just because these are you know, the experts writing the readmes and they're using all the shortcuts that I didn't know existed. So that, that mixed task do takes a list of, of uh, tasks. So instead of making two different lines, you can combine that. So maybe you can use that in your own in builds. And again, bunch of output. So that was building xdoc. Now up, change directory up and over back to Elixir and make docs. And this will do its thing. Because Elixir, like Jose said, is made up of, I can't remember the exact list, but Elixir itself and Mix and the other bits, you actually end up with a list uh, with doc sets for several different things. So you'll get, there, there's the list that I can't remember, EEX, Elixir, XUnit. Those are all separate documentation sets. And if we take a look, that, those are the beautiful XDoc format documentation, which points out another thing that all contributions are not source code. The XDoc team did amazing work on this figuring out, there were discussions about which font weight to use and how far to indent things to make the visual experience just what it needed to be. Those are things that I can't do, but I'm glad that other people do them and contribute because now when I build my own project documentation, it'll look that great too. Other things that uh, you can do are, I was thinking while listening to some of these talks that some of you I know know how to do animations of, of uh, concepts and if that's your thing and you know how to animate the, the concept of some of these complicated things in distributed computing, do that and contribute it. And then people who want to give talks can, can use them. So whether you're fixing issues or adding features, these are all kind of things you might get to. It'd be great if everyone out there was you know, developing lots of complicated Elixir code, but I never will. I can probably count on one hand the number of patches I've sent in that actually touch source code. For me, it's doing things like this. It's uh, helping with the documentation to make it easier for other people. So don't think that because you're not writing a bunch of source code, you're not contributing. Everyone who's coming, who's talking about it, trying to convince your coworkers to use Elixir <laughs> is uh, is helping. So whatever skills you bring or that you want to learn, if you come and ask a really great question that gets someone else thinking about it, maybe they learn something and then they teach you, that's all community building and it's really, really important. So I'd love to see this community stay open and welcoming like it has been for me so far. So I want to say thanks to the conference for inviting me and Chargeify where I work for paying for my travel and time to be here. Um, the couple of blog posts I mentioned are there. You'll find you'll be better off going to my what, my blog and clicking on them. 
you can find me all of these places. Elixir Talk would be the, or Phoenix Talk, depending on what it is, would be the best place because I'd love to have more conversations on the mailing list. Like I said, there are so many places to ask questions and they get scattered. Come on the mailing list and, and contribute and participate there. But if you don't want to talk in public and you're, you have a question about any of this, feel free to email me. I'll do my best to find you the right person who can help. My blog, follow me on Twitter, and I'm usually in the IRC and Slack rooms. If Although I do have a day job, so I tend not to participate too much during the day. But ping me and I'll come back and uh, answer later if I can. And most of all, have fun. Because if it's not fun, why are we doing it? So I'm hoping to see everyone on the mailing list and contributing. Next year, I want to see someone else up here giving this talk. <laughs> Thank you.